Good afternoon, students. Today is Thursday, 25 February, 2021. Now, I should say at the outset that <clears throat> today is your exam day, so all of you will be going into Canvas at some point today and taking the exam. If you, if you have not yet taken the exam, then please don't watch this video. This video will be tested on the second exam, which is several weeks from now. I'm posting it so that I stay on track with my lectures. So, assuming that you have taken the exam and have come back to watch this video, let's continue. <clears throat> Today is the first of two lectures this week. Your second lecture will be posted probably on Saturday this week. Once again, I had a meeting on Wednesday yesterday, so I'm running a little bit behind. But you will get two lectures this week, as usual. Um, we're going to be spending three days on this New Mexico Supreme Court case called Morris versus Brandenburg. And I think I'm going to post my lecture notes for you probably sometime later today or perhaps tomorrow. My lecture notes go on for about nine pages. And since this is not a law school class, I assume that some of this material will be difficult for you. So I'm going to post my lecture notes so that you can follow along with my lectures for the next two uh, videotape lectures. Okay, so let's get started. Today's the first of three days on this case. I'm going to take it nice and slow so that you can understand everything I'm explaining to you. Um, we'll break it up into about one third of the opinion um, each time we meet, so to speak. So let me begin by holding up my copy of the opinion. And that's what this is called. It's called a judicial opinion, or case, if you will. This is my copy. You can see it's 28 pages long. I've printed it. I punched holes in it so that I can put it in my notebook. And you can see I've got it all marked up on a typical page, that I'll, which I'll open at random. You can see that I've underlined certain parts and made notes in the margin. Okay, so you'd like, you should have printed this out by now. If you haven't, you can pause this and go ahead and print it. And then when I direct your attention to particular pages, you can read along with me. So to begin, let me explain some basic things to you about a judicial case or a judicial opinion. First of all, the caption. Notice at the very top, the top line, it says, in the Supreme Court of the state of New Mexico. So New Mexico is one of the 50 states, as you know, and it has a judicial system of its own that is distinct from the federal judiciary. And the state of New Mexico has a structured judicial system. At the very top, it has a Supreme Court. Down below that, it has what are called appellate courts. And below that, it has district courts. So three levels of courts in this state. Um, let me explain the what's called the caption. If you look at the next line underneath the title, it says opinion number. And you'll see 2016-NMSC-027. Now that's easily explained. This is the year 2016 in which this opinion was handed down or released to the public. NMSC stands for New Mexico Supreme Court. 027 means it's the 27th opinion released by that court in that year. So the court has kept quite busy issuing rulings. This is the 27th ruling of that year. I don't know how many there ended up being in 2016, but this was the 27th. It then has a filing date. That's the date of the decision, 30 June 2016. So it came out in the middle of the year. It follow, There follows a docket number, which is a number for the court's record keeping purposes. And then what's called the caption. You'll see it says, Catherine Morris, MD, Arup Mangalik, MD, and Asia Riggs. Those are the three plaintiffs. They're the three people who together filed, the, filed this lawsuit 
in a district court. They later became petitioners. Once they lost at the trial court level, they, I'm sorry, they won at the trial court level, they lost at the appellate court level, and then they petitioned the New Mexico Supreme Court. So at that point, they became known as petitioners, the ones who filed the petition. You'll not then look, notice the lowercase letter V followed by a period right here. That simply means versus, which is a Latin word for against. So it's these three individuals against or versus the following. Carrie Brandenburg. Carrie Brandenburg is not only an individual like you and me, but she, is a, she has a particular role or office. And she was at the time district attorney for Bernalillo County, New Mexico. So she was the initial defendant. She was the person against whom the lawsuit was filed. And there was another individual who was sued as well, Gary King, who was the attorney general of the entire state of New Mexico. So they were initially the defendants, right? They, the lawsuit was filed against them. And later, when, they, when the petitioners took their case to the, to the Supreme Court of New Mexico, they became known as the respondents. Okay? The petitioner was asking the Supreme Court for relief and Brandenburg and King were responding to that petition. So they're known as the respondents. Okay, so that's just an explanation of some basic features of the first page of this opinion. Now, notice in New Mexico, they have an interesting uh, system of citation. If you turn the page, actually a couple of pages, you'll notice that the paragraphs are numbered from beginning to end. So you have paragraph one right here, and down below the, on the page, you have paragraph two. If you look at the last page of the opinion, you'll see paragraph 59. So this is page 28 of the opinion. And right at the top, it says, right over here, 59. And all it is is the court saying, it is so ordered. So this opinion issued by the Supreme Court consists of 59 distinct paragraphs. And if you were referring to um, something in this opinion, you could refer to the particular paragraph by number. And these, these numbers are permanent. So when this opinion gets published in a bound form, in a bound volume, probably several inches thick, all of these, all of these numerals will be in the published bound volume. So you can always refer to any particular paragraph of any New Mexico Supreme Court opinion. So not every state does it this way. Many of them refer to page numbers of the published or bound edition. Actually, the New Mexico system is superior in at least one way. It, when this opinion was published, it was released way before the, the bound volume was published. And in states that go by page numbers, there are no page numbers for a while. Only when the published bound volume appears are there actual page numbers, and that would be a permanent reference. So I, I kind of like the New Mexico system because the paragraphs, the paragraph numbers stay the same whether you're talking about a paper version or the published bound version. Okay, so when you see a reference in this opinion to a particular paragraph, you now know what that, what's going on there. Sometimes in this opinion, you see the abbreviation NMCA. That stands for New Mexico Court of Appeals. So that would be the intermediate level below the Supreme Court, but above the district court. And sometimes you see the abbreviation NMSA. That stands for New Mexico Statutes Annotated. Sorry about my voice. It's a little rough today. It might improve as I go along, or possibly get worse. We'll have to wait and see. Now, what does, that, what does that mean? First of all, what is a statute? A statute is simply an enacted law. It, it, was, it was drafted and passed by the legislature of the state and eventually signed into law by the 
governor, who is the, ch the chief executive of the state. So once that point is reached, once, once that bill becomes a law, it's called a statute. Not a statue, like a statue of Abraham Lincoln, but a statute with a T in it, S-T-A-T-U-T-E, -E, statute. And that gives rise to words like statutory, okay? And the word annotated means that it's supplied with illustrative or explanatory material. So each law that's enacted in the state of New Mexico eventually finds its way into a bound volume. And these bound volumes are called New Mexico Statutes Annotated. It contains not only the actual words that were enacted into law, but commentary or annotations on those laws, which illustrate them and explain them. They tell you, for example, when the law was passed, when it was signed into law by the governor, and what its history is, and things like that. So don't be, don't be thrown off by the many acronyms that you see. Every acronym that you see in this case has an explanation, and I'm, I'm now giving you some of the main ones. An acronym, by the way, is a series of letters that, that, come in, that are the first letter of various words. So NMSA is New Mexico Statutes Annotated. That's called an acronym. Okay, let's move on. You'll notice on the page, second page of this opinion that the court lists various amici curiae. Okay, you see that right here? It says for amici curiae. Now let me explain what that means. That's the plural, by the way. Amicus curiae, which is how you pronounce those Latin words, li means literally friend of the court. Amicus curiae, friend of the court. So let me read you the actual definition of that term from Black's Law Dictionary. Amicus curiae means literally friend of the court. The word amicus means friend and curiae means court. Okay, amicus curiae, friend of the court. A person with strong interest in strong interest in or views on the subject matter of an action may petition the court for permission to file a brief, ostensibly on behalf of a party, but actually to suggest a rationale consistent with its own views. So that's the, dic that's the dictionary definition. Let me now explain it. When a case is filed, people who are not parties to the case, but who have an interest in the outcome of the case can petition or request the court to allow them to file a brief. And that brief will make an argument one way or another. And the, the hope is that the court will take that argument to heart and rule in a way that is favorable to that person who's filing the brief. So if you look at the, if you look at page two, you'll see that here, here are some of the various amici or people who filed briefs. Um, let's see. Okay, look at the very top of page two. It says Modral, Sperling, Roll, Harris, and Sisk. PA. They're located in Albuquerque, New Mexico. It also says Alliance Defending Freedom, which is located in Washington, D.C. Those two organizations worked together to file a brief. And so you'll notice it says, for Amiki Curiae, New Mexico State Senators, Mark Moores, Stephen P. Neville, et al. Et al. means and others. It's Latin. It stands for et alia. It's abbreviated as et al, and it means and others. So what does this mean? A group of senators in the state of New Mexico hired a law firm in Albuquerque and this organization called Alliance Defending Freedom. 
it hired them to research and write a brief in their behalf, on their behalf, to express their view on how this case should come out. Other amici were filed by um, a group called Compassion and Choices. There's a group called Not Dead Yet, which filed a brief through an amici. There's an organization called the ALS Association for New Mexico chapter. That's the, uh, what's, that's a me, I, I'm not sure what the A stands for, something like ametrial lateral sclerosis, and that's called Lou Gehrig's disease, if I'm not mistaken. So a group of people who have, uh, who work with ALS patients filed a brief in the court. They requested permission and were granted permission. The New Mexico Psychological Association filed an amicus brief, the American Medical Women's Association, and as you can see on page three, the Archbishop John Charles Wester of the Archdiocese of Santa Fe. So a Catholic organization requested and was given permission to file a brief. So you've got a lot of interesting organizations who wanted to get involved in this case. So you have the, the immediate parties, plaintiff and defendant, and a whole group of amici who have an interest in how this case comes out. Now that is the plural. The singular is amicus curiae. The plural is amici, A-M-I-C-I, -I, amici curiae. That means two or more. It's like alumnus and alumni. If you, when you become a graduate of UTA, you are now an alumnus. Two or more of you will be alumni of UTA. Okay, so in Latin, you have singular and plural versions. Now, I posted already on Canvas a nice color map of the structure of the New Mexico judicial system. And you can see that it's divided up into um, a Supreme Court, an appellate court and several district courts. So you can look it over if you want. Obviously, I won't test you on the details, but it shows you that every state has its own judicial system. In New Mexico, the Supreme Court has five members. Some states have seven. The United States Supreme Court has nine. Notice all of them are odd numbers, whether it's nine, seven, five, even three. The idea is to avoid a tie. So um, a United States Supreme Court ruling could come out, if all nine members participate in the case, it could come out nine to zero, eight to one, seven to two, six to three, or five to four. Unless one of the justices withdraws from the case, it's impossible for there to be a tie. But that does create a problem. Suppose one justice withdraws from a case because of a conflict of interest. That leaves eight justices, and in theory, that could end up four to four. And if that ever happened, the lower court ruling would stand. Whatever ruling is being appealed, it stands as it is. You have to have at least five to four to, over, to reverse the lower court ruling. Okay, so we have a five-member Supreme Court in New Mexico. How did this case come out? It ended up being a five-to-nothing ruling. Five-to-nothing. In fact, you can see I have a breakdown. I always write down on the first page right here a breakdown of how it came out. So this case came out as follows once the rulings were issued. There were five justices out of five who voted to reverse the ruling of the district court, which is the trial court, the, lo the first court that this case got involved in or, or entered into. There were zero just justices who voted to affirm the district court. So you either reverse a lower court or you affirm it. Affirm it means uphold it. Reverse means overturn it. And it was a five to nothing case. Now, the five justices who sided with the um, defendants in this case 
um, each of them could have written a separate opinion, and that's very often the case. But in this case, only one of the five justices wrote an opinion, and the other four agreed with it. They, in effect, said, I agree with every word of it. I don't need to write my own separate opinion. And the justice who ended up writing was Edward L. Chavez. So one of the five members wrote an opinion, and the other four simply agreed with it. The technical word for that is concur. They concurred with Justice Chavez, and that means to run with him, concur. C-U-R means run, C-O-N means with. So when you concur, in effect, you're joining up with, you're running with the other or others. The chief justice of the New Mexico Supreme Court at the time, and maybe still now, I don't know, was Charles W. Daniels. The chief justice has special responsibilities and duties, uh, which I don't need to go into here. But when it comes to a vote, the chief justice gets one vote, just like everyone else on the court. And in this case, Justice Daniels concurred with uh, Justice Chavez and did not write a separate opinion. There's one other peculiarity of this. One of the justices who heard this case was James Hudson. And James Hudson is not actually a member of the New Mexico Supreme Court. He was sitting in uh, for someone who was absent. Let me see whether I can find this quickly. I think it may be on the last page. Yes, on the final page, you'll see a listing of the justices, and it says James Hus Hudson district judge sitting by designation. So I, I assume that what happened is uh, whoever was the fifth member of the Supreme Court either withdrew from this case for some reason, such as a conflict of interest, or maybe there was a vacancy on the court that had not yet been filled, in which case a district court judge was elevated temporarily to the Supreme Court. And you can see why, because otherwise it would have been four members and that could have resulted in a tie. So they needed to make it five and they simply probably randomly selected one of the district court judges to come up and sit on the Supreme Court for a while, maybe to hear only this one case, maybe to hear several cases. Okay, so notice I'm going very slowly. I'm just explaining some basic things to you. This may be the first judicial opinion you've ever read in your life. And I well remember how confusing it was when I went to law school. I was 22 years old. I was fresh out of college. And while I did have a, a course in, in college in which we discussed some Supreme Court opinions, still it was a very new experience for me in law school. And a lot of things I read early on were confusing to me. And I wish my professor had explained some of the basic things to me as I'm explaining to you right now. So this is not a law school course, I understand that, but I chose this case for you to read and for us to discuss because it raises a very important issue. The issue is called the right to die. Is there a constitutional right to die that allows people to end their lives without being punished by the state in which they live. So we're reading this case for its philosophical significance. But because it's a legal case, it has a lot of things that are likely to confuse you or puzzle you. And that's why I'm going slowly at first to explain them. Those of you who go on to law school, and maybe none of you have plans to do so, but if some of you plan, uh, do go on to law school, I hope you remember this discussion and it may actually help you. Maybe you'll have an advantage over your fellow law students because you've already been had a lot of this stuff explained to you. Okay, let's get into the details of this case now. There's a law, a statute in the state of New Mexico, or was at the time of this case, and it prohibits assisted suicide. So I'm going to read to you the actual words of the statute. This was the law 
on the books in New Mexico when this case got to the, into the court system. Here's how it goes. Listen carefully and then I'll, I'll explain some of it. It says, assisting suicide consists of deliberately aiding another in the taking of his own life, period. It then says, whoever commits assisting suicide is guilty of a fourth degree felony, unquote. So the statute is short and sweet. It contains two sentences. The first sentence tells you what exactly is being prohibited. And the second sentence tells you what the punishment is for someone who breaks that law. So let's go back and look at the first sentence. It the law is called, I'm sorry, the criminal offense is called assisting suicide. It does not prohibit committing suicide. Okay? That's, that's a separate matter. It may or may not be illegal in New Mexico to kill yourself. This is about assisting someone else in killing him or herself. So it's called assisting suicide. It's not about attempting suicide. That may well be a separate offense. Trying to kill yourself may be a punishable offense in some states, in, maybe even in New Mexico. But this statute that I just read to you does not prohibit attempting suicide. It prohibits assisting suicide, which means actually assisting someone in killing him or herself. And what is the content of that offense? It means deliberately aiding another in the taking of his own life. Now the, the pronoun his is a masculine pronoun, but I assure you that it covers women as well. Usually somewhere in each state's statutes, it says, unless otherwise specified, the pronoun, the masculine pronouns, he, him, his, or himself, are to be understood as including women or females. Okay, so whenever you see him, you should read it mentally as him or her. So a woman couldn't avoid being prosecuted under the statute by saying, Your Honor, it says him, and that implies male, I'm not a male, so the statute doesn't apply to me. That would be laughed out of court if you made such an argument. The opposing attorney would point out that another statute in that jurisdiction specifies that him includes women or girls, females. Okay, so what we have is a, a, a statute in the state of New Mexico, and one of the questions in this case is whether this statute even applies to a case where a doctor helps a patient end his or her life by, for example, prescribing a lethal dose of a drug. So that's going to be one of the issues. That's why I wanted to make sure we got that statute out on the table right away. Now let's look at the second sentence of the statute. The second sentence says, whoever commits this offense, which is called assisting suicide, is guilty of a fourth degree felony. Now the fact that they have a fourth degree felony in New Mexico implies what? It implies that they also have a third degree felony, a second degree felony, and a first degree felony. And of course they do. There could even be a fifth degree felony. So what, what the legislature is doing is it's saying that this particular offense slots in at the fourth degree felony level. It's not a third degree felony or fifth degree or any other type of felony. And <clears throat> felonies, I can tell you, are typically distinguished from misdemeanors. Um, and different states distinguish them in different ways, but the rule of thumb is this. Any offense punishable by uh, one year or more of imprisonment is a felony, or perhaps six months or more. Anything other than that is considered a misdemeanor. So a felony is always more serious than a misdemeanor, and you probably knew that already. 
There are lots of different felonies. Murder is a felony. Robbery, larceny, kidnapping, rape, arson. Those are some of the common law felonies. So what is the punishment in New Mexico for a fourth degree felony? That's the next question. Well, we're not told in this statute, but elsewhere in the New Mexico statutes, we are told what the punishment is. And I looked it up and here's what it is. The basic sentence for a fourth degree felony, such as this one, is 18 months in prison. So that's a year and a half. And there can be also a fine of up to $5,000 or both. So the maximum sentence, if you're convicted of a fourth degree felony, such as assisting suicide, is you get 18 months in prison and a $5,000 fine. So um, judges typically have discretion at sentencing. So sometimes the, the statute says explicitly, if you're convicted of this offense, you can be sentenced to anywhere from two to 10 years imprisonment. And the judge who sentences you can pick a sentence anywhere in that range, as little as two years, as many as 10, okay? So you could get less than 18 months in prison if the sentencing judge determined that that was appropriate. And you could also be fined of an amount less than $5,000. So what this sentencing scheme tells you is the maximum sentence. It doesn't say there's a minimum, but it does say the basic sentence is 18 months. So if you're a defendant and you've just been convicted, you should be worried that you could spend as much as a year and a half in prison. I said earlier that the statute does not cover suicide. It does not cover attempted suicide. It covers assisting someone in committing suicide. Now you may be wondering, uh, how can you punish a, someone who commits suicide? Right? How, if someone commits suicide, then he or she is no longer in existence. And how do you punish the dead? But actually, when you think about it, it is possible to punish someone who's dead. And it depends on what the purpose of punishment is. If the purpose of punishment is to give people what they deserve, which is called retribution, then obviously you can't punish someone who's dead because dead people can't be given what they deserve. But what if the purpose of punishment is to deter law-breaking by others other than the one who is punished. That's called, that's called a utilitarian rationale for punishment rather than a retributive rationale. So what if our goal in punishing people is to deter other people from committing the same act for which you are being punished? Clearly then, punishment of dead people makes sense. In fact, historically, people who committed suicide were indeed punished for it in the following ways. They were punished by forfeiting their property to the state. Now you may say, well, why do dead people care about that? Well, ordinarily when you die, your property goes to your heirs, your surviving spouse, if any, your children, if any, your other rel relatives, and so on. Well, what if by committing suicide, you forfeit your property and it goes not to your loved ones, but to the state, the state of New Mexico or whatever. Obviously, that's something that people don't like. That might deter people from killing themselves. If we say to people in general, don't kill yourself, because if you do, your family will be deprived of everything you own. Many people, I assume, would say, gee, I'm tempted to kill myself and I'd like to do it, but not at just any cost. And if the cost of me killing myself is that I deprive my loved ones of resources that may cause them to go destitute, then I better not do it. So if the purpose of punishment is to deter, 
which is what I'm calling the utilitarian justification for punishment, then punishing suicides is makes sense, right? It makes sense to publish to punish people who kill themselves. Other punishments of people who kill themselves are things like being denied a Christian burial. Uh, in, in the Middle Ages and later, people who killed themselves were kept from being buried in a churchyard. They were often buried at a crossroads. And sometimes when they were buried at a crossroads, a stake was driven through their heart as a, as a warning to people. So when you drove by the cross, everyone who went through the crossroads would see these stakes and they would know that someone was buried there and that the person who's buried there had done something terrible, killed him or herself. So there were various punishments for uh, killing yourself. In fact, um, a personal note, my first publication, my first scholarly publication back in 1982 was on precisely this topic. The title was, uh, let me think, The Legal Status of Suicide in Early America, colon, A Comparison with the English Experience. So what is that, 18, 39 years ago, almost four decades ago, I published my first article and it was on precisely that topic. It appeared in the Wayne Law Review, which was the law review published by my law school. Okay, so um, just a little bit of historical, um, some tidbits on the history of, of suicide. Now, a couple of other statutes in New Mexico have, have a bearing on this topic. Let me tell you what they are. First of all, I have my copy here. I printed out the statutes. I found them online, which is one of the nice things about the internet. If we didn't have an internet where these things were published, I would have to go to a good law library. And UTA, while it has some legal materials, I assure you, well, I'm pretty sure, UTA does not have New Mexico statutes annotated on its shelves. So what I would have to do is go to the SMU Law Library, or perhaps to one of the other local law schools in the Metroplex, and, and see whether they happen to have New Mexico statutes. And if they didn't, I might have to write to some uh, school in New Mexico and ask them, would you, would you kindly make a copy of certain statutes for me and send them to me by mail? And I'm sure they would charge me probably a significant amount for that, a per page amount, maybe $2 per page or something plus postage. So what a wonderful world it is to go on the internet and be able to read or print out <clears throat> New Mexico's statutes, which is what I did here. Okay, the first statute that has a bearing on this case has to do with various immunities to liability. This one has to do with physicians who bring about the death of their patients. Actually, bring about may not be the correct term. So, let me put it in context. Two classes of physician in New Mexico are immune from criminal liability um, where their patients end up dead. Here's the first one. I'm just gonna read the pertinent part to you. Listen carefully now. A healthcare provider or healthcare institution, such as a doctor, acting in good faith, and in accordance with generally accepted health care standards applicable to the health care provider or health care institution is not subject to civil or criminal liability or to discipline for unprofessional conduct for doing any of the following five things. And I'm just going to read you the first one because that's the one that's relevant. Okay, so you're not liable criminally for any, doing any of the following. Number one, complying or attempting to comply with a health care decision of a person apparently having authority to make a health care decision for a patient, including a decision to withhold 
or withdraw health care or make an anatomical gift. Now I'm going to stop right there because that's the only part that's relevant to what we're discussing right now. What does that mean? That means if you're a physician or other health care provider in the state of New Mexico and your patient has the authority or your, your patient or someone who represents your patient has the authority to make health care decisions, if that patient or authority representative of the patient requests you, the physician, to withdraw health care or withhold health care treatment and you end up dying, you are not liable for assisting suicide. In fact, you're not liable for anything in the state of New Mexico. Murder, manslaughter, assisting suicide, or anything else. This statute I just read to you immunizes health care providers when they are following orders from a patient or a patient's representative and that order says withdraw treatment from me and let me die or withhold treatment from me and let me die. So a physician is protected but you're always allowed by law if you're a physician to follow your patient's directions and if the patient says take the machines off me and let me die or don't hook me up to machines in the first place and if you obey that and your patient dies you're not legally liable either in a civil suit for damages or a criminal suit where the goal is to punish okay that's the first exception and this is discussed in the opinion Okay. Second, I found a different statute and printed it. I'm just going to read the first part of it because that's the only part that's relevant. So listen carefully. This is a second form of immunity for a doctor. A health care provider who prescribes, dispenses, or administers medical treatment for the purpose of relieving pain and who can demonstrate by reference to an accepted guideline that the provider's practice substantially complies with that guideline and with the standards of practice identified in other statutes, shall not be disciplined pursuant to board action or criminal prosecution. I'm going to stop right there because that's all we need. What that says is that if you prescribe pain relief medication to your patient, and if your prescription is in accordance with the guidelines, if your patient should die from that, you are not liable, civilly or criminally or professionally. You can't be disciplined by the medical board. You can't be uh, censured. Uh, you cannot be um, kicked out of the medical profession. Uh, at all. Okay, remember that. That's the pain relief immunity. If you're prescribing pain medication because your patient is in great pain, and if in order to get rid of the pain, you have to prescribe a large dose of painkiller that actually ends up killing your patient, you are not liable. All right, so keep those two exceptions in mind, right? By law in New Mexico, physicians are immune to being prosecuted or sued um, if they fall under either of those two statutes. And we'll come back maybe at various points and I'll remind you of those two provisions. All right, let's turn now to the issue. What is the issue in this case? What's it all about? I'm going to read from page three of the opinion. Actually, let me check something. I have a reference to three in my notes, but I, I can't remember whether that refers to paragraph three or page three. So let me, let me just check that. Paragraph three. It's page three. So now I know that whenever I put a reference in my notes, it's pages. So I'm not using New Mexico's 
paragraph scheme, at least in my lecture notes. Okay, here we go. Sorry about that. From page three, if you're following along, and I hope you are, you can find exactly what I'm about to read to you. Here it is. According to the court, quote, the question in this case is whether a mentally competent, terminally ill patient has a constitutional right to have a willing physician consistent with accepted medical practices prescribe a safe medication that the patient may self-administer for the purpose of peacefully ending the patient's life, unquote. That's the issue. Is there not just any old right, but is there a constitutional right, a right under the New Mexico Constitution to have a physician prescribe a drug for you when you're terminally ill and mentally competent? A life that, a, a, a pain, I'm sorry, a prescription for a drug that has the purpose of ending your life peacefully, which I assume means without pain and distress. So that's the issue in this case. This case is often called a right to die case. It's, it's not really a right to die, that's, that's a catchy slogan. It's, it's more of a right to have the assistance of a physician in bringing about your death. And that's, that's known in a pithy way as the right to die. Notice, it's a right, if it is a right, it's a right possessed by individuals, like the plaintiff in this case, Asia Riggs. It's a right, it's a legal right, but not just a run-of-the-mill legal right. It's a right that's incorporated in the state's constitution, not just in its statutes. The constitution is the supreme law of the state. And any, any statute that's in contradiction to the Constitution must be struck down as unconstitutional. So the Constitution of the state of New Mexico tell, specifies what it takes for a statute to be valid. And some statutes violate the language of the Constitution. And when they do, the court will strike them down, like hitting them with a hammer or something. The, the court in that case would say, bad statute, you violate the supreme law of our state. The court is in effect telling the legislature and the governor who enacted that law, you ran afoul of the fundamental document of the state, the constitution. That process is called judicial review. Judicial review means the judiciary Right? The judicial branch of government, of which the Supreme Court is at the top of the hierarchy, the Supreme Court is typically the one, but not the only one, who reviews statutes to determine whether they comply with the Constitution. That process is called judicial review. I think I'll post something on Canvas that explains this process that I'm calling, that's called judicial review. You can read it and learn a little bit about it. And I may well test you on it, so read it carefully. Again, anything I post on Canvas, unless I explicitly say optional reading, you are responsible for. Okay, so that's the issue. It's a famous or somewhat famous right to die case. Other states have had cases like this as well. The reason I chose New Mexico is that there's only one opinion, so it's not confusing. It's not that long. It's only 28 pages long. And New Mexico is close to Texas. So it's interesting that a state that's contiguous with Texas has dealt with this issue. I'm not aware that the state of Texas has had a case like this. Um, if it has, I'm unaware of it. Uh, maybe it hasn't. Um, but anyway, I chose this case because it's clearly written and it raises all the right issues about whether there's a right to die. Notice something about what I just read. It says a willing physician. No physician is ever required in the state of New Mexico to prescribe a, a drug 
to a patient with the purpose of ending that patient's life. Obviously, some physicians would be very uncomfortable with that. Some physicians might have a religious or moral objection to prescribing such a drug. So <clears throat> this law allows a, I'm sorry, this law um, allows, I'm sorry, the issue in this case is whether a willing physician uh, may prescribe such a drug. Uh, nobody is trying to get any physician to do such a thing against his or her will. The plaintiff in this case, Asia Riggs, found physicians who were willing and able to comply with her request. So the, the question of, of forcing a doctor to do something like this is not even in play, not even at issue. Okay, now let me say a few more words about the so-called right to die. If there is indeed a constitutional right to die in New Mexico, what that means is three things. It means you have a right against the legislature of New Mexico not to coerce you into not having a physician prescribe a, a, a drug such as that for you. So you have a right that the legislature not threaten you or coerce you. Secondly, you have a right that the executive branch of the state of New Mexico, the governor and various agencies of government, not prosecute you for violating the law, the law that's unconstitutional. And third, you have a right, even if you are somehow prosecuted and convicted, you have a right that the court, that the trial court not punish you. So notice there are three branches of government, the legislature, the executive branch, usually the governor or president, and the judicial branch, the court system. If, if there is indeed a constitutional right to die, you have a right against all three branches of government. You have a right that the legislature not coerce you. You have a right that the executive not punish you, or I'm sorry, not prosecute you, or bring charges against you. And you have a right that should charges be brought and a conviction be the result of it, you not be punished by any court. So if you have a constitutional right to die, that's a pretty powerful thing, isn't it? That means you can um, suppress all three branches of government. And that's true of individual rights in general, isn't it? If you have an, a constitutional right, a First Amendment right to speak, that means you have a right against the government, all branches of government, the legislative, the executive, and the ju judicial. So individual rights are wonderful things, aren't they? They're rights you have and I have against whom? Not against other individuals, but against government, our own government. Now, maybe you think fond thoughts of your government. Most of us do, right? Government is implemented to protect us and promote our welfare. And government is a good thing, but government can also be a bad thing Government can harm us greatly, mainly by punishing us. So if you have a right against your own government, that's, a, that's an important and powerful thing. The first 10 amendments of the U.S. Constitution, which are called collectively the Bill of Rights, set forth a number of individual rights, rights that you have against your own government, in this case, the federal government. Although some of the rights that are in the Bill of Rights apply not only to the federal government, but to state governments. They don't say that explicitly, but the U.S. Supreme Court has, over the years, ruled, <clears throat> excuse me, the U.S. Supreme Court over the years has ruled that certain rights in the Bill of Rights apply not only to the federal government, but to the state governments as well. And I'll say more about that as we go along. <clears throat> okay, so the question in this case is whether individuals like Asia Riggs or you or me, whether we have a right under the New Mexico Constitution, actually you and I <clears throat> are not subject to the New Mexico Constitution, so maybe I should have said just Asia Riggs because she's a resident of New Mexico. 
if she has a right to die, that's a right against government, the government of New Mexico, all three of its branches. It's an interesting question. <clears throat> if there is a constitutional right to die, who possesses the right? Is it Asia Riggs, the individual, or is it her physician, or perhaps both of them? I, I'm sure the physician will claim the right. The physician will say, I, as a physician, have the right to prescribe lethal doses of medicine to my patients at their request. Okay, so the physician could be said to have the right in addition to the patient or instead of the patient. It's similar to abortion. Most people think that the case of Roe versus Wade in 1973 confers on women the right to terminate their pregnancies. But if you read the case very closely, as I have many times, at no point does the court ever say that women have the right to terminate pregnancies. What it says very clearly is that physicians have the right to terminate the pregnancies of women at their request. So that, that's subtle, a subtle difference. Um, technically, physicians have the right to abort, not their patients, the women who, who, on whom the procedure is carried out. So what was the resolution of this case? How did it come out? Now, we're not going to get into the reasoning yet. That'll come in the second and third lectures. Uh, today is more of an introduction, but how did the case come out? Let me give you a quick sketch. <clears throat> On page four, early in the ruling, the court says, quote, we decline to hold <clears throat> that there's an absolute or fundamental constitutional right to a physician's aid in dying. So the, unquote. So the court is saying there is no right to die under the Constitution of the state of New Mexico. So the court ruled against poor Asia Riggs. This woman, and we'll talk more about her as we go along, this woman wanted a physician to prescribe a lethal drug for her, not necessarily because she wanted to use it right away, but she wanted to have the opportunity or option of using it. And she lost. At the end of this long process, the Supreme Court said, sorry, Ms. Riggs, you do not have a right to have this drug prescribed. And if the state of New Mexico wants to prohibit and punish it, it may do so without violating any right that you have. Okay? The court also said on page four, that the statute, the one I read to you about assisting suicide, the statute is, quote, not unconstitutional on its face or as applied to petitioners in this case. Now, that's a subtle distinction. I'm, I don't think I'm going to explain it to you right now, but perhaps later. The court is saying, on its face, that means as it is written, it does not, I'm sorry, it is not unconstitutional as it is written. It conforms to the Constitution. And the court is saying also that as the words of that statute are applied in this case to Asia Riggs, there's nothing unconstitutional about it. Sometimes the court says things like this. The court says this statute is constitutional on its face, but it's unconstitutional as it's being applied. For example, what if there is a statute on the books that says people can apply for a permit to march in the streets as a form of protest? That statute might be constitutional on its face, but what if it's applied in a particular case in an arbitrary way? What if the city officials deny a parade permit to a certain group because its views are disliked or offensive, but it allows parade permits to other groups. What we have here is a statute that is constitutional on its face. There's nothing wrong with having a statute on the books like that, but it has to be administered or applied fairly or equally or equitably. 
And sometimes that's not done. So what the, what the court of New Mexico, the Supreme Court is saying is this statute, as it's written, is compatible with the Constitution. It's, it conforms to the Constitution. It's constitutional. And as it's applied in this case, it's also constitutional. The statute was not applied in any arbitrary or discriminatory way to Ms. Riggs, Asia Riggs. Okay, I told you earlier that all five justices voted to reverse the ruling of the district court. So that means <clears throat> Asia Riggs and her two, her two doctors won at the earliest court, the trial court level. And at the end of the process, the Supreme Court reversed that trial court ruling. Okay, so Asia Riggs won initially, she lost on appeal, and the Supreme Court upheld the appellate court ruling. So you can say the Supreme Court reversed the first court, but it upheld the appellate court. You see what I'm saying? Uh, it's a little confusing. We could say that the ultimate ruling was to uphold the court below or reverse the court way below. So let's continue. You may be wondering why the New Mexico Constitution is the Constitution being discussed in this case. Well, the reason is that the plaintiffs argued that the statute the New Mexico statute violated the New Mexico Constitution. The plaintiffs, for one reason or another, never argued that the New Mexico statute on assisting suicide violated the United States Constitution. And let me say that again. This case, in this case, the plaintiffs' attorneys argued that the New Mexico statute on assisting suicide violated the New Mexico Constitution. They did not argue that the statute violated the United States Constitution. Therefore, once this case was resolved at the New Mexico Supreme Court, it ended. There was no appeal to the United States Supreme Court. Now, is it ever possible to appeal a state Supreme Court ruling to the United States Supreme Court? Yes, but only if you raised a federal question during the state case, and that was not done here. I don't know why. Uh, it could be a mistake. The attorneys for Asia Riggs and her doctors may have made a mistake. Maybe they should have argued both that the statute violates the New Mexico Constitution and it also violates the United States Constitution. That way, if, they, if the New Mexico Supreme Court ruled that it does not violate the United States Constitution, they could have appealed that to the United States Supreme Court. I don't think it was a mistake, however. I think that the attorneys decided strategically to ignore the U.S. Constitution and focus only on the New Mexico Constitution. Why? Well, it, the answer is pretty simple. The United States Supreme Court had already ruled a few years earlier, I think it was 1997, maybe a decade or so, or a decade and a half earlier, almost 20 years earlier, actually. The United States Supreme Court had already ruled in a case out of Washington and another case out of New York the Supreme Court of the United States had already ruled that there is no right to die incorporated in the United States Constitution. So the, the attorneys in this case, this New Mexico case, must have decided that it was unlikely that the United States Supreme Court was going to change its mind in less than 20 years and rule in their favor. So why bother arguing it? Right? If, if, you're, if you don't think you're going to win in the federal system, then stay focused on the state court system. And the hope was that the New Mexico Supreme Court would interpret its own state constitution in such a way that she would be given a right to die. 
that there would be a constitutional right to die. So I'm explaining a little bit of the strategy that went into this case. Why was there no federal constitutional question? I think the, the, the attorneys decided uh, that it was a loser. Why bother making that argument when you're only going to lose it? Focus on your strongest argument and put all your eggs in that basket and hope for the best. Unfortunately for them, they ended up losing. In fact, we're going to come back to that United States Supreme Court ruling. It's called Glucksburg, Glucksburg versus Washington. And it, comes, it turns out to be relevant to this case. The Supreme Court of the state of New Mexico looked to the U.S. Supreme Court case for guidance. And they, agreed, they ended up agreeing with the U.S. Supreme Court and saying that that's how we're going to interpret our own constitution. We're going, we don't have to, but we're going to interpret our own state constitution in the same way that the U.S. Supreme Court interpreted the U.S. Constitution. What the attorneys were hoping is that the New Mexico Supreme Court would interpret the New Mexico Constitution in a different way and give citizens of New Mexico more rights than they have been given by the U.S. Supreme Court under the U.S. Constitution. And maybe I'll take an opportunity now to explain something interesting and important. A state constitution can give residents of that state more rights than they possess under the U.S. Constitution. In other words, suppose the U.S. Constitution gives this many rights. Think of my hands as forming a sphere. Okay, I don't have a sphere here. Um, Imagine I'm holding a sphere, a globe, and let that globe be a certain size. It, 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 has the, it contains all the rights under that constitution. No state constitution can shrink those rights and make a smaller sphere. Okay? If the U.S. Constitution confers this many rights, then every state must confer at least those same rights. But state, court, state constitutions can confer more rights, in other words, a bigger sphere than the sphere of federal rights. So to put it in a nutshell, to put it succinctly, a state constitution can confer on its own state's citizens more rights than those citizens have under the United States Constitution. But no state can interpret its constitution in such a way that its citizens have fewer rights than those that have been conferred by the U.S. Constitution. So it goes only one way, doesn't it? States can give you their citizens more rights, but never less, never fewer rights than the U.S. Constitution confers. Okay, so a little bit of strategy as to why the attorneys, they were hoping that the New Mexico Supreme Court would interpret the New Mexico Constitution so that it conferred more rights on citizens of New Mexico than they had under the U.S. or federal constitution. Okay, one more thing. Um, well, I keep saying one more thing, but next thing, there may be some more. Um, and I need, to, I need to wind this lecture down because we're already over an hour in. So just permit me to say a couple more things. First, after this case was resolved, there's no place to appeal, right? The New Mexico Supreme Court is the highest court in the state. And I just explained why you can't appeal to the U.S. Supreme Court, because there's no federal question involved. What can Asia Riggs do at that point? Well, one thing she can do is wait. Uh, Supreme Courts have been known to overrule their own previous decisions. It happens from time to time. Sometimes it happens because the membership of the court has changed. So imagine this, New Mexico Supreme Court has five justices. Those five justices may leave the bench. Some of them may leave the bench either through death or injury, that, injury or disease that keeps them from remaining in office, or they may get tired of it and resign the office and take up some other line of work. That has happened. So 
when that happens, if and when that happens, that justice will be replaced. And there's a procedure, as you know, for replacing Supreme Court justices. I don't know offhand how it's done in the state of New Mexico. It can be either the governor appoints a new justice, or perhaps there's a statewide election to elect a new justice. Or it could be some mixture of, the, of those things. So, um, for example, maybe the governor appoints someone and that person begins serving, but only until the people have spoken. And the, and the people could end up throwing that justice out. Okay, so what if 10 years after this opinion was handed down in 2016, what if in 2026, the membership of the court has changed? What if only one of the five justices remains on the court? Different judges or justices interpret things differently, sometimes for political reasons. Um, so what if several years after this opinion came down, the same case was filed? The court may accept that case and overrule this case. So one thing Asia Riggs could do when this case came down in 2016, one thing she could do is say, okay, we need just to wait a while, wait a few years, and if she's still alive, she or someone like her in her situation can try again, file a new case in the district court, try to work it up into the Supreme Court, and maybe a new court with new members will overrule Morris versus Brandenburg and decide that there is, after all, a constitutional right to die in New Mexico. But the, the disadvantages of that, as you can see, is that you're gonna have to wait. And it's, there's no guarantee that even a court with new members will reach a different result. All I'm saying is that is one thing you can do uh, in this case is wait for a new Supreme Court and get another case moving through the system and hope for an overruling. All right, what, what can be done short of that? Well, Asia Riggs might turn to lobbying the legislature of New Mexico. If the legislature of New Mexico allows physicians to prescribe lethal doses of drugs to their competent, terminally ill patients, then there would be no need for a constitutional ruling, right? The, the, someone might challenge that law and claim it's unconstitutional, but it's unlikely to succeed. It's up to the legislature to decide whether citizens of New Mexico have a right, not a constitutional right, but a legislative right to end their lives. So <clears throat> what Asia Riggs might have done when this ruling came down is not give up, but turn your attention from the courts to the legislature and try to get the legislature to pass a law. And guess what? Each session of the New Mexico legislature for the past several years, there has been a bill introduced and it currently has the name, I'm glancing at my notes to see whether I can find it offhand. Uh, quickly. Oh boy. I don't see it, but I'll mention it when the time comes. It, it has the name of an individual, something like Mary Beth Whitehead. I, evidently that's a patient who wanted to end her life and was denied the ability to do so. So they named the law after her. There is, as I speak these words right this minute, there's a bill pending in the New Mexico legislature that would amend the law and confer on citizens of New Mexico a right to end their lives. Right? And that, that would be to achieve what Asia Riggs wanted in a different way. Right? It, would, it would achieve it through legislation rather than through constitutional adjudication or constitutional interpretation. So that bill was introduced one month ago when the new legislature took its seat, took their seats one month ago, the bill was introduced and it's now in committee. Whether it will be enacted into law later this year remains to be seen. I'll be following it. 
Maybe you will too, if you're interested. Maybe Asia Riggs started a conversation in her state that will culminate in new legislation that will allow people like her to get that prescription that she wanted. Okay, a couple more quick things, I promise, and we'll, we'll be done. I'm just trying to get to a major subsection of my notes. There were nine judges involved in this case altogether. Who, who were they? There was the trial judge, okay, one trial judge, and she ruled in favor of the plaintiffs. There were five Supreme Court justices at the end of the process, and there were three appellate judges in between. So one, three, five. That's a total of nine judges. How many do you think agreed that there is a constitutional right to die in New Mexico? How many of the nine? Two. Two. Now, that may surprise you. Maybe you thought that all seven, I'm sorry, all nine of them would have ruled the same way, but that was not the case. Two of the three appellate judges ruled in favor, I'm sorry, two of the three appellate judges believe that there is a right to die in the state of New Mexico. Interesting. So, um, wait a minute. I'm sorry, one of the three. So the trial judge and one of the three appellate judges held that there is a constitutional right to die. The other seven said, no, there isn't, including all five on the Supreme Court. All right, sorry, I didn't mean to confuse you there. Um, I, I, I found the following an interesting question. I wondered whether there was a disparity among the female judges and the male judges. And I was just curious. I don't know why I looked into it, but there were five male judges out of nine and four female. So <clears throat> all five of the male judges said there's no constitutional right to die. Two of the female judges agreed with them for a total of seven. Two of the four females held that there is a constitutional right to die. And I wonder whether there's something to that. Um, I don't know of any studies, but are, are women in general more likely than men in general to support a right to die? And of course, if the answer is yes, the next question would be, why is that? What is it about men and women that lead them to take different positions on an issue like that? So all I'm doing is raising a question. I don't have any answers to it. So I've uncovered some interesting data, but I don't know what to make of it. And I certainly can't explain it. One more, uh, one more point, I promise. Does a judge's vote necessarily reflect his or her views on the wisdom of the law that's being reviewed? In other words, what if the five justices on the New Mexico Supreme Court who ruled that there's no constitutional right to die, would they, if they were in the New Mexico legislature, does that mean they would have voted against a law that confers a right to die? Not necessarily. They might well say, as a legislature, as a legislator, I would support a law that gives individuals a right to die. But as a judge, I have a different role. My role as a judge is to read the Constitution and apply it to the statute and see whether the statute violates that Constitution. So a judge could consistently say all of the following. Imagine I'm the judge. I'm on the Supreme Court of New Mexico. I can say all of the following. If I were in the legislature, if I were in the legislature, I would vote for a law that gives individuals a right to die. But as a judge, I don't see that the Constitution prevents the legislature from ruling that there's no right to die. And that's because the role of a legislator is different from the role of a judge. The judge's job is very narrowly focused. It's not about enacting laws that are wise or 
just or fair or efficient uh, or beneficial to the citizens. That's not the judge of a jo- the job of a judge. That is the job of a legislator. Legislators are policy makers. Judges are not policy makers. Judge, the job of a judge is to, is to look at the statute, compare it to the Constitution, and see whether it violates it. That's it. And that has nothing to do with policy. It has nothing to do with whether the statute is wise or stupid or brilliant. That's a whole other question. And let me end with this. I said that was the last point, but really this one is. Sorry. Another thing Asia Riggs might do after losing this case in the Supreme Court is, besides waiting for the membership of the court to change and trying again, besides lobbying the legislature for legislation, the third thing she might do is amend the Constitution. That can be done. Every Constitution, both at the federal and state level, has in its own language a provision to amend itself. In fact, the U.S. Constitution has been amended 27 times already. It hasn't been amended in a while, not in a couple of decades, but it has been amended 27 times, and I'm sure it will be amended again at some point. So the people of New Mexico could rise up, if they're upset with the Supreme Court ruling, they could rise up, and um, implement the amendment process in their state. They could put a constitutional amendment on the ballot, if that's how it's done in New Mexico, I think it is. They can put it on the ballot, the people of New Mexico can vote, and if they, if they vote in favor of amending the Constitution, then the Constitution will now say something different from what it said in this case back in 2016. So amending the Constitution is always a possibility. And I'm not sure that that process is being undertaken, but it certainly could be. Um, If the people trying to get the legislature to act keep failing session after session, they might turn to a constitutional amendment. And whether that will work will depend on public sentiment. If, um, If the Constitution can be amended only if two-thirds of the voters agree, then you should take surveys of the people, and when it looks like more than two-thirds of the people of the state agree, then you can kick in the amendment process, and it might actually succeed. So there you go. That's an introduction to this case. We have two more lecture periods to finish it up. Next time, I'm going to go through the background of the case, procedural history. I'm going to give you a timeline and we're going to see whether the we're going to see whether assisting suicide uh, I'm sorry we're going to see whether prescribing a lethal dose of a drug violates the statute which prohibits assisting suicide and and eventually on the third day we're going to get to the constitutional issues. So sorry I kept you so long I'll make it up to you on uh, other days where it'll be more like an hour. All right, have a great day, and um, I'll see you next time.